praise God. Thank you for joining everyone. I, I, I pray that the Lord is blessing you all really good, even though it's cold outside. And you know, I don't dig the cold. I don't, don't dig the cold. I don't like the that cold. That can't though. be an excuse though, right? Say, say again, Vicky. That can't be an excuse when you're online. I know. I know. I'm in the warm house. Hey, Derek. And thank God for maybe Are maybe we should say <laughs> Hold on, hold on. You uh, y'all, I'm just ready to warn y'all. Forgive the way I look. Okay. Uh, well, we can't see you. Oh. Now you can. I was just warning y'all. Derek. Hi, were you on the prayer call this morning? Are you the one that plays the piano and sings? The answer, he's on mute. Yeah, he's muted, but he is. That's yeah. the one. Okay, thank you. Well, Derek, you are muted, sir. Oh, I'm like, ooh. I, I I didn't make it this morning, but I was on the rest of the mornings. But I wasn't yeah, there. Yeah, he oh Derek was ooh. He was yeah, he 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 sang and played the piano live and it was good. Praise God, praise God. Look at that. Hey man. All right, Vicky, you could put your hand down now. Oh, sorry. That's okay. That's all right. All right. We're gonna pray and get started. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity for my small group, for this opportunity to, to sit with your people and to share the word of God. <clears throat> this word of life, Lord God, is, 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 is marrow to our bones. It is life to our spirits. It is all that we need and more. And we thank you for giving your word to us and for sharing with us and for being with us. The Bible did say that wherever the twos and the threes are gathered, touching anything concerning you, there you are in the midst to bless and to do good. And for that, we thank you. Thank you for all of our brethren that are joining us from near and from far. And we ask that your presence will hover in this room and bless each and every one of them. I pray that you'll bless their families, bless their businesses, bless their ministries, hallelujah, bless their health, Lord God. And we give you thanks for that which you've already done. And we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody say in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hey, in Vicky, Jesus' I'm sorry. name, amen. Huh? Hey, Vicky, I'm sorry. You know, in I'm Jesus' name, old people, old amen. people don't know, old people don't know technology. But, but I, I just unmuted. Yeah, that was me playing this morning. How you doing? <laughs> well, um, brother Tim already answered me. He already said it was you. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just said, ooh, technology. But I'm learning, so it is what it is. Me and you yeah, both. Yeah, you got you know. to I. I used to always, I had a secretary that did everything, so, but I'm learning that. <laughs> I understand that. I understand that very, very, very well. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Our Bridget just joined on, um, um, Derek. Sister Bridget just I'm joined sorry. on. I'm sorry. What, what you say? I'm, I'm sorry. I Sister couldn't hear you. Bridget, Sister Bridget just joined on. Yeah, I just I just talked to her. Well, yeah, we were oh, on the phone. For, hey, Bridget. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'm sorry, well, Brother Don. This was from this morning. Okay. I'm sorry. Yep, yep. All right. If you have your Bibles, um, turn to Ephesians chapter number four. Um, we're going to be reading a few verses beginning at verse 17 through to 25. I'm going to switch it up tonight and read from the message translation. Um, I, as pastors sometimes say, I want you to hear the word of God uh, with different ears. Uh, and so um, I found that the message translation of this particular text was very interesting. So here we go. Here beginneth the reading of God's word, Ephesians 4, 17. Paul writes, and he said, so I insist, and God backs me up on this, that there be no going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. They've refused for so long to deal with God that they've lost touch, not only with God, but with reality itself. They can't think straight anymore, he writes. Feeling no pain, they let themselves go into sexual obsession, addictions of every kind and perversion. But that is no life for you. Jesus. You learn Christ, Paul writes. Every time yeah. I say that, I, 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 I get shivers because I remember yeah. my, my maternal grandmother saying, and you have not so learned Christ. Whenever I would do something or say something that was out of out of uh, out of righteous or out of touch, she would say, "But but that's not how you learn Christ." So so uh, this this verse touches me deeply. Verse twenty, but that is not 
There's no life for you. You learn Christ. My assumption is that you have paid careful attention to him. Be well instructed in the truth precisely as we have it in Jesus. Since then, listen to this, we do not have the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life, it has to go. Amen. It is gotten through and through. Get rid of it. And then take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. Verse 25. What this adds up to, then, is this. No more lies. No more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other anyway, after all. So when you lie to others, you end up lying to yourself. So far, that right. is scripture. And my topic for our teaching tonight is simply this, transformed. Transformed. Amen. Amen. For an illustration, I, I read the story by Father Greg Boyle, or, or G-Dog as he was called, as he was known in his neighborhood. Has been, he's been ministering to the gangs of East Los Angeles with the gospel of Jesus Christ for some years. Every day he wades into the danger zone, connecting with these young men and women who have long arrest records and long prison records. And he shares the good news of Jesus Christ with them and calls them to break with the current, their current wicked life, the life that they have known and begin to trust Jesus Christ for salvation. His message is simple and real. He says, you can have a future or you can have a funeral. But Jesus will forgive your sins, wash your past clean in the eyes of God and give you a hope and a future. Now to date, this ministry has seen thousands leave the pseudo gang family and have come to a real family of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's not because Father Boyle has watered down the gospel. No, in fact, his message is plain. That is, Jesus is calling you to radically break all the destructive sin-inducing ties of your former lives. And as a result, more than 1,500 ex-gang members from East LA have trusted Jesus and have taken the steps in a new direction with the guidance and help of Father Greg Boyle. They have to learn a new language. They have to buy new clothes. They have to learn how to make an honest day's wage. In other words, they have to allow the spirit of the Lord to transform them through his spirit. Amen. And this article was, was published in the USA Today newspaper in, in July of 2005. I thought it was appropriate for our teaching tonight of, of transform. You are being transformed by the spirit of God. Now, the Bible says that a true Christian will undergo a metamorphosis, a transformation, a change of nature. Uh, when the Spirit comes in, it renovates a person's core values, and it imprints Christ's character on your ca character. In fact, it eliminates your old character and replaces it with Christ's character. This change happens from the inside to the outside. The speed of this earth, internal overall, if you will, which, which the Bible sometimes calls sanctification, it will vary from person to person. But the certainty is rock solid. Spirit wrought change is so fundamental. It is so self-evident to Christianity that it is expected, even commanded in the New Testament. What is more, change that radical on the inside will inevitably show itself in your behavior on the outside. That's why the Bible says, Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
all things are passed away and be and behold all things have become new uh, there is a kind of interface between your inner world and your chosen actions in the outer world but romans 2 6 says and when your turn comes to stand before the living god he will render to each one according to his works so the evidence that we are truly born again will be demonstrated in the most obvious and irrefutable of ways, meaning what we actually did and what we didn't do. Why? Well, your deeds are your deeds. Your deeds are what you did. The only person you can't hide from is God. They are the infallible proof of what's in your heart, what fills your soul so if you are internally an angry person you're bitter hurtful you're vengeful and spiteful in your thoughts guess what people will see of your actions those same emotions those same things will spill out of your heart to your outer person in matthew 7 jesus told a bunch of spiritual Let's call them posers, right? These Pharisees. He said to them that a tree is known by its fruit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then he added further in Matthew 12, he says, out of the abundance, the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Matthew 12, 33 and 34. You see, you can fake your true identity for a while. But in time, it's going to leak out. And what is really and truly inside of us will, will spill out on the outside. So Jesus is asking for a, a transformation, a true revolution. And the change that God brings about in our lives through the Holy Spirit is pervasive and is common to every believer. As a matter of fact, there, there's even an entire book of the Bible that's built on the premise that if you are a true believer in Christ, it was, it's going to show up in your behavior. And this book, I want you to read it. This book is 1 John. 1 John lists 11 proofs, 11 evidences that you have been born again. Like the one found in 1 John 2 and 3. And I quote, by this we know that we have come to know him. How? If we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. You see, there's a new norm in the life of the believer. Now, they, they simply feel that they need to obey God. Whereas before, it was, a, it was obeying the devil. It was a choice of whether or not they should or they shouldn't. But once you've come into Christ, there's this compulsion to obey the word of the Lord. Here you go again in 1 John 2 and 5. He writes, quote, By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in that same way which he walked. In other words, real Christians ought to live like Jesus lived. Just like Jesus. So that when people see us, they are drawn to him, Jesus, by observing the way we walk. Does that make sense? And so we look at 1 John 2.15. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Or John, 1 John 3.9, no one born of God's, of God rather, makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And that's important. Loving your brother is important. The, the motto of First Church, as you know, is love God, love people. So if you, if you don't love God or you're, I'm sorry, if you don't love your brother, if you exhibit behavior that shows me that you don't love your brother, it must be that you're not truly born again. 
oh, I know that stings. But remember Galatians chapter number five, the the five, the, the, the fifth chapter of Galatians lists the nine fruit of the spirit. And the first one is love. The list goes on and on, right? Presenting to us the link between what's on the inside and what spills out on the outside. When I read this study, there is one part of the study that, that stopped me in my tracks. And I realized that, man, I don't measure up to all of this all the time. Because basically it's saying we've got to be perfect. Then, so, so if you're born again, you shouldn't be sinning at all, right? You don't sin at all. But we all know the truth about ourselves. We're far from perfect. We, The Bible says we sin daily. Paul says he dies daily because of that. So you ask, what's, what's wrong with me, Pastor Don? And you say, I know in whom I believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which he has committed unto me against that day. I fail so much. What's wrong with me, you ask? If I'm supposed to be a butterfly now, why, why, why am I still crawling like a caterpillar? Am I really transformed? Oh my. But the Bible says we're supposed to be transformed. And it's happening for some of us at a faster pace than others. Deep, deep in my heart, I want to share this lesson because I want to highlight these important truths of where the rubber meets the road. Uh, here, here we see the necessity for this inside out change. We know what we are being changed into. And we know the inner power of the Holy Spirit. And that is what's fueling our life change. Now, let me talk about how to plug into that power, how to really allow that power to transform you. Verse 17 of our text, number one, keep your eye on the target. And the target, of course, is Christ, right? We want to be Christ-like. Growing up, I played lots of sports, and, and a lot of the sports that I played involved some kind of a ball. I played soccer, uh, football, as it is called in other countries. I played, I played uh, cricket. That involved a ball. I played baseball that involved a ball, right? And 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 in, in if you played sports like I did, especially in baseball, when a batter isn't fooled by an inside curveball, what does his teammates say? They say good eye, good eye, because you can see a curveball if you're paying attention. And, and and I've taken a golf lesson or two. I was in uh, Amelia Island in, in Florida some years back, and my boss uh, would say he's going to go play golf. And I was like, man, I've never played golf. Do I look like a golfer to you? And he said, all right, I'll pay for some lessons for you. And I remember the, the golf pro saying, he said over and over, keep your head down and keep your eye on the ball. It's all about the ball. Now, I know you want to kind of look where the ball is going, but he says, bring it back. Keep your eyes focused on the ball. That's the target. Paul tells us the target. Verse 17 issues a blunt command. It says, therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord. You should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. Once you are saved, once you come in here, man. You ought not to walk like the Gentiles walk. Here, the word Gentile is a general reference to all who are non-Jews, all sinners, all pagans, to the lost world. Paul is saying, your life must no longer resemble those who are still in their sin and are without God. Once you allow the Holy Spirit to begin to transform you, those days are behind you, just like those 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 uh, gangsters in East L.A. Father Boyle says those days are behind you. And what do they look like? They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God. 
because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their heart, Paul writes, they become callous and give themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity, Paul writes, with a desire for more and more. But that is not how you learned Christ, he says again. And so the description here pictures an incapacity to, to rightly perceive and respond to the truth about God. Left to ourselves, we, we give ourselves over to empty pursuits, the futility of our thoughts, serving our body only with, with promiscuity and seeking deeper and deeper into sinful behavior. Every kind of sinful behavior, Paul writes, with a desire for more and more. Paul says that uh, it's not the way you learn Christ. That's not how you learn Christ. Keep your eye on the target. Becoming like Christ is your calling. It's your purpose for breathing. It's your reason for living. It's, it's Jesus everything. Everything else is secondary. I remember years ago, because we were one God Pentecostals, um, they used to call us Jesus, Jesus only. You remember those days, mom? They would call us Jesus only. And they still call us that. And even and, now. Yeah. And I'm telling you, you know, I was like, not only am I Jesus only, I'm Jesus everything. Right? Verse 22 says, this is the second point. We need to cut all ties to your former life. In verse 22, we read, you were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. So put off your old self, put off the old man, which belongs to your former manner of life and it's corrupt through deceitful desires. And that phrase right there, put off, it describes a decisive moment where you literally put it off. It's not a negotiation. That is the end of the former you. This, this verb uh, means to strip off as you would uh, strip off old and dirty clothing that is filthy. In this verse, what is removed and laid aside is your old self. The old you, the you you were before Christ saved you. Paul says, get those old ways of meeting your needs out. Uh, those old habits that mark your Christless days off your back, get it out of your life. Throw it away. Cut it at the root. Listen to me. Don't go to those websites anymore. Throw away those books and magazines that you used to pick up. And don't buy any more of them. And don't hang out with those people and that keep you doing the things that you know are wrong. Those old ways are dead to you now. So get rid of every trace of them. Every trace of them. Every trace of them. One of the best known theologians and church father of history is Augustine. He lived 354 to 430 AD. He was saved out of an immoral and debauched lifestyle. And before his conversion, he had a mistress her name was Claudia. Shortly after Jesus found Augustine or he found Jesus. Claudia saw Augustine on the street in the city and she said, Augustine, Augustine. He paid no interest to her. He paid no, no attention to her. And she cried out again, even the more. Augustine, Augustine. She cried after her old lover. Augustine paid no attention and she ran after him and cried out, Augustine, it's Claudia. He turned around and he said, but it's no longer the same old Augustine, he replied. And he continued on his way. That's what Ephesians 4.22 means. Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. The old person is gone. So let me tell you a little bit more about what happened to those gangbangers in East LA. Father Greg Boyle told them that also their gang tattoos had to go. The gang tattoos, you see, linked them 
to a past life that no longer defined them. And it also could put them in serious danger while walking on the streets if somebody from another gang saw them. So Father Boyle created a free service using some of the local doctors from the local clinics and hospitals. And he employed them to remove those old tattoos, scrubbing the bodies of these gang members, to remove the last remaining marks of their rebel past. He said it was not an easy procedure. And many of these street tough former gang banners said it felt like someone pouring hot grease over my skin. It was so painful. You see, it may cause you some pain to break with your old friends and your old habits that are ruining your faith. It may, it may bug you to stop doing some of the things that used to provide maybe temporary pleasure. You want to plug into the real power? You want to plug into the spirit for real and attain a lasting life change? Here's where you start. Like Father Boyle said, no double life. Yes, Jesus. No more straddling the fence. No more, you know, doing this today and that tomorrow. Make a decision now to cut the ties that links you to the ways that are not Christ's ways. Amen. Hallelujah. Number three, in verse 23 of Ephesians 4, you read, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Amen. I love that. Notice that this, this verse is rendered in the present tense. It means it's ongoing. It's a progressive shift that is happening in the capacity of your mind now so that you can spirit, spiritually deserve the options and decisions with which you're going to be faced. Being renewed in the spirit of your mind means a new, never before way of walking, of thinking. It's beginning to take root in your heart. The spirit of your mind is something like the ability to sense or to discern the hidden sins and the hidden dirt, if you will, in an idea or a thought or an opportunity before it attaches itself to your life. And if you know what Romans 12, 2 says, it, it's like that command. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This mind renewal, hallelujah, is a deep spiritual change in how the mind assesses and values things. It, it acts like an early warning system, if you will, of, of a kind of spiritual filter, stopping temptation that used to fly under the radar and get you. Somehow it's now stopped. That's the renewing of the mind. And so how, how does this fine tuning of the mind to spiritual realities take place? Well, 2 Corinthians 3.18 offers another verse that can help us. And it says this, and we all watch this with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Glory, glory. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And if you've truly been saved, you, you know what I'm talking about. You Amen. feel this transformation from one degree to another. Like even after this week of consecration, you know, you feel one degree closer to the Lord. Maybe two degrees closer to the Lord because you are, you are subduing your natural urges and you are replacing it with prayer and fasting. And that draws you closer to the Lord just a little bit. You're not trying to change God. You're, you're changing yourself because God never changed. You see, the, the prayer and the fasting is intended to have a positive change in us. One degree mm -hmm. by one degree. 
Amen. The same goal as before, true Christians take on the image of Christ in their lives. So oh. how can this happen? I want you to pay close attention to the wording of this text. It, it says, and we all beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed. In other words, we, we become what we behold. That's why the Bible says, put no evil things before your eyes, right? So if I give my time to gazing intently at evil things, they may be on the TV, eventually you will adopt the ways and words of what you see. However, if you are looking deeply into the word of God, your mind will be reprogrammed so that it will take on the mind of Christ. So where is this primary place where you can see the glory of God? As I just said, it's in the word of God. What did David say in Psalms 119.11? Thy word have I hid in my heart. I've that stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So your mind will become sensitized to the things of God. Your mind becomes sensitive to the word of God. And when the word of God hits you, you can feel it. This guy by the name of Leroy Ems, he was telling a story of how the word of God has been working in his life. He writes, as a new Christian, he was reading through Colossians 3. And it says, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. And Leroy said to himself, I, I tried to slide past it, but the Lord kept bringing me back to the words, get rid of anger. He says, I had a violent temper. And whenever it flared up, I would haul back and, and I would bash my fist into the nearest door or wall. And even though I often blooded my knuckles, uh, and once he said, I completely smashed a beautiful ring that my wife had given me but I couldn't seem to stop. Yet here was God's word in my ears. Get rid of anger. So he said that last day he made a covenant with God. I promised him that I was going to work on it. And so he said my first step was to memorize that verse of scripture. I prayed and asked the Lord to bring this verse to my mind get rid of anger whenever I might be tempted to lose my temper. And I asked my wife to pray for me and re reminded me of this verse if she ever saw me failing in my promise to the Lord in regards to my temper. So he says Colossians 3.8 became a part of my life and it gradually removed that sin of temper from my lives. He wrote this in, in, a, uh, in an article entitled The Lost Art of Disciple Making. He wrote it in May of 2006 in Preaching Today magazine. So when I marinate in my mind in God's will and truth, what I'm doing is I'm uploading God's eternal truth into my spirit. I'm inputting God's word into my mind. Ultimately, this changes your thinking and sensitizes your mind to detect even the smallest amount of sin in what you're facing. So like the pro told me, keep your eye on the ball. Keep your eye on the target. Cut ties with your pre-Christian your pre past. And the scripture is telling us, be renewed in your mind. And so number four, Paul writes in verse 24 of Ephesians, chapter number four, put on a new you. Put on a new self, new mind. This new you is created after the likeness of God, and only the Holy Spirit can do this in true righteousness and holiness. Remember what we read in verse 22. We are urged to shed off the old clothes of your former ways of life. Why? Why? So that when the Lord clothes you again with his righteousness, it's brand new. And this new righteousness is, is created by God to fit you perfectly. 
but with the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul writes to the church at Galatia in chapter number two and 20. It's no longer I who live. Come on, somebody. But Christ who lives in me. Glory to God. It's Christ's life that I, you should see when you see me. Uh, now it's it's how I do my job. It's how I treat my spouse. It's how you live out your single life. It's how you parent your children. It's how you respond. It's what you think. Even how you feel and, and, and will find its reference, its reference in your new relationship with Jesus. It's not I, Paul says. It's it's not I, it's Christ you're seeing. So this is who you are from now on. This is your new identity, your new nature in, in action. And so let me read once again from the message translation. I like how it translates these verses. It says, quote, from now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language to you. That means nothing to you. But God speaks your mother tongue, and you hang on every word. For you are now dead to sin, but alive to God. That's what Jesus did. That means you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day, Paul writes. Don't even run little errands that are connected to that old way of life. Throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full-time into Christ. Remember, you have been raised from the dead. That's what the Holy Ghost did. You've been raised from the dead in God way, in God's ways of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live anymore. After all, you're you're no longer living under that old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. And, and I'll close with this. We all know that one day it'll be all over and we will be like him. The Bible says that we we shall see him as he is. For, for those of you who are looking for the Lord Jesus to come down to earth when he returns, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, that's not going to happen. The Bible says that if the spirit that raised him from the dead dwell in you, hallelujah, he that raised up Jesus Christ will also Quicken your mortal bodies. Glory Give light to, to your mortal bodies. This can't, flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. And so if you have the Holy Spirit living in your heart, the Bible says, come on. It will, it will indeed translate you, transform you to meet him in the air. To meet him in the air. To meet him in the air. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his, Paul says. You don't belong to the Lord if you don't have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will transform you little by little. It'll transform you. It'll transform you. I promise you. Then my mom told you how I was like before the Lord saved me. She's here with us. Yeah. You know, she's here with us for the next few weeks. Ask her, how was Brother Don like? I was a different guy, man. A menace. <laughs> I was I was a menace, right? I was, I was, this is it's, it was a different brother Don. And so I'll end with this quote. It was um a quote that was written on the gravestone of Ruth Bell Graham. She actually saw this sign on the highway while she was driving by and she stopped and wrote it down. It read, end of construction. Thank you for your patience. Meanwhile, this work in progress needs intentional, deliberate focus on the target that drives the passion to become like Christ. And I said, amen, because for her, that meant stripping away this world from her life having her mind renewed by God's word, purposefully living out her new identity in Christ. And with that, I'm going to end. 
That's all I've got for you tonight. Amen, everybody. Praise